What I'm going to present is food security in the middle income world, the case of China and other fast growing middle income countries. So uh, I'm from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. The work that uh, I present here represent my research group. So although I'm sent by my academy and uh, to, to this conference, but sorry. Okay. What I'm going to talk about is really my understanding as an economist, the traditional food security, the concept, and then food insecurity in the middle income world and China using some cases to compare, and then mainly trying to lay out the challenges and the meeting the nutrition insecurity, you will see what I'm going to talk about. Well, I'm not talking about enough stuff, or so, calorie or something, but micronutrient deficiency in my kind of talk. So, oops. In the traditional food security in phase one of development, we know that countries at start of phase one of economic development is characterized by poor, malnutrition, food deficit, and high prices, and access is difficult. So that was a characteristic of the first stage of development. And then the food security in those kind of contexts would be about having adequate supply of affordable food. And each household or each nation's population would have throughout the year ensure health and productive life. That's the economic growth path of the development. And insufficient calories and protein are the main characteristics. And because we know without enough calorie, we know we result in poor health, increase the uh, morbidity and the stunting and wasting. On the way here, I was talking to my South African colleague on the same issue about really what kind of stunting the situation there. Of course, wasting as well, chronic diseases are compared. And then that we know it's negatively affects income and leading to the poverty trap. So that the first stage. And they, it, to explain this, the source of problem of households really the economic access. You know that, but and then economic access for the rural poor really depends on income and food prices. So when prices are low, people can afford to it. And then when prices and when income are rising, food is even more affordable. So that's what we've been working, and that's in the first stage. We have to work hard on this, typically on access by two front, increasing income, lower the food prices. So, and then in that economy, you know, the phase one root of success really, the economy starts to offer the poor. So we have increasing income, failing prices, falling prices, and also that, you know, stage one of transformation of the economy leads to urbanization by mainly enjoying the low wage manufacturers. And urbanization phase one and temporary migration and some permanently of them. So, and this would really also result in raising, increasing income and raising consumption. So that vicious circle begins pushing economy to the middle income, middle in, uh, level, middle income level, like what we are seeing in China. So this is really graphical illustration of the importance of green revolution and how it contributed to lowering food prices, where with increased agricultural investment into and the favorable food policies, I mean farm policies, reform and then subsidies there. The effects is really the higher income for agriculture households and also lower prices for all consumers in the economy. So that's one of the success, success of the first stage of the, develop, oops, the development. We know this vicious circle begins pushing economy to middle income, falling mobility, and then urbanization really comes into a kind of place. So those I've already say, said earlier, so the metric of success for the traditional food security policy is really sufficient, low-priced calories and protein, and macro, I don't know whether it's correct to use, macronutrients is enough for most of the populations. That mainly we say calorie, so we're not, 
And then, but those working in factories and construction sites are healthy and strong, and those left behind on the farm also are healthy and strong because this is producing lots of cheap calories and then vegetable proteins and, and food security in this, this stage really characterizes an important part of the development strategy when countries are just beginning their development push. So when they are poor, people need sufficient macronutrients. So I, I still remember when I was a, a middle school, high school kid, I consumed two big bowls of rice, but now I consume less than of half a small bowl of rice. So that's from my own kind of uh, experience, you could see the shift of also. So at that stage, macronutrient sufficiency is a character. And then China's experience since the 80s, when the for poem start, is really a classic example of such kind of uh, uh, shift moving, you know, from a food insecurity to food security state. You know, this one I've showed several times. China basically from the 80s had nearly 10% of GDP growth annually. This year we're down to 7.8 or something, but still high enough. And agriculture growth remained four. In this year about four or something, but the key, key fact is that agriculture annual growth is four times the population growth. So that really ensured food security. And lots of people moving into cities, into the off-farm sector, that's also partly raising income and moving people away from farm and countryside. So we had sufficient calories, like uh, protein. Uh, so uh, when you would look at FAO stat, we found that China is more or less like other countries in terms of, like other countries in comparison in terms of the calorie intake. And, sorry, oops, it's not moving. I'm not, okay. And the food security challenge in the middle income world from economic context is really problem and reasons that, and policy option, that's what I'm going to mainly talk about later in the next day. So this is, so in the economic context, economic setting for this is important to understand why my argument comes later on, because this is really, can explain how malnutrition and obesity and all those can coexist in rising incomes. We also talked about on the way here. So this is really the stage that the rapid growing the country. And then economic development in the process of transforming from poor, rich, but in fact it happens in two phrases now. The second phrase from we are trying to move from poor to, to from middle income to rich. And then this one is difficult. So who we are talking about here? In countries with income per capita level between 5,000 and 12,000 US dollars per capita, so less. And these are the among those countries who by the World Bank char characterized as apprises for higher income states, including China. And there are lots of other similar characteristics apart from income level. So in this phrase, especially for rapid growing country, economic dynamic of a country in diff is in different forms than phase one. Remember we had low wages, but this stage we have wages are rising and also rapidly and permanent urbanization like what happened in China and other mid-income countries. And low manufacturing subsistence agriculture are fastly disappearing. And then re-industrialization lead to high value innovation based industries and service sectors. Remember, this is really, we are not producing strong laborers for farming, but we need, you know, skill sets for those individuals who wants to take advantage of here. And a high premium on education health. This is where we are coming from. And needs to have skills in math and science language and in order to get a job in a higher raising uh, wage kind of state or industry or the economy. Oops. Huh? Oh, point here. Oops. Okay, I'm sorry. So it's technology is too high for me. It's full. And then uh, at this point, of course, takes place in an environment that is not that a fully developed, in uh, fully developed countries where 
we talked about at dinner time last yesterday about market functions. And this stage, in some countries, especially in the fast developing country, we're still under developing economic and social institutions. Imperfect markets for credit and less than perfect health insurance and food security and welfare systems. So all those are in place of completion or improving. So these are the typically low, you know, and the uh, permeable safety net that everybody wants to have there. So those are the characteristics. Oops. And then, of course, at this stage, there's a high level of inequality. So measured by Gini coefficients is almost ranking 0 0.4 or 41 above, and China's above 50. Although the national statistics says it's less than 35 or 38, but our calculations, our researchers' calculations are more than 50 of this. So the implication of this high inequality is that although average per capita income rises and absolute gains, poverty is disappearing, but there are many near poor. So the number of China, 150 million people, less than $2 a day. But there are more than uh, 300 million people, less than $3 a day. So lots of near poor. So of course, China has a lot of millionaires in the world. And the food security in this stage is not macronutrient deficiency, but lots, uh, you know, as in, we have already shown the others, but lots of micronutrient deficiency. We call it hidden hunger, where it's iron, zinc, and vitamin B, and more of those micronutrient deficiency. Okay, what is the evidence of this micronutrient deficiency in the middle income countries? I wanted to give you a couple of comparisons, the whole world and case of China. So this is really the statistics about the whole world. The percentage of iron deficient anemia in the world, uh, in the countries that are put into comparison. So you look at China, we have preschool 20% and then pregnant women 29 and reproductive aged women 20. So more or less like, you know, Thailand had 25 and Brazil preschool kids have 55. So th those are the statistics we've drawn from the World Bank and then FAO. So, so obviously we're among those uh, like micronutrient deficient countries. And our own study, we tested about more than 60,000 you know, students across China, we found iron deficiency anemia is a huge problem. We also tested the infants where, you know, the, from six months to like uh, uh, 20, 20 months or somehow, we tested 2,000. What we found is that, you know, among 2,000 babies, nearly 1,000, nearly half of them are micro, uh, iron. Uh, deficient anemia. And then this is really anemia rate nearly 50%. But, you know, we only have less than 5% who stunted and wasted. So when you measure by stunting weight, China, we don't have problem. And then it's funny thing is that when you look at their parents, or their mothers, it's not really the money issue because their parents were not that really micronutrient deficient or iron deficient in that. So they're getting enough calories but not enough nutrient, micronutrients. So this is really what we did the test and we know that, you know, about 40% of them will fail their baby infant IQ test because someone subnormal uh, cognition and subnormal motor skills and those really we know that, 20, you know, this is the numbers we show that. So 25, in a, more than 20% of cognitive delay and more than 30% of motor delay. So if we add it together, it's about 40% of those in the sample really significant delay in either these two indicators. And that we know is going to have permanent kind of imp in the impact in their lifetime because nutritionists told us, you know, all of those, if you didn't get corrected when they're infants, it will in they have a lifetime impact on their IQ and mental health, weight, uh, height and weight, and then general health kind of performance. So that's what we are more worried about. So what does it mean? The harshest of terms that we have 20% of future labor forces are not ready, you know, to take up the job they're offered, even there's availability. So they're basically, 
you know, physically and mentally handicapped. We use quotes and quotes and handicapped because of those problems. Sorry, okay. And the childhood anemia, I didn't really say that the school age children, and we all, we, as I say, we tested more than 60,000, so the anemia rate was 30%, 33%, oops. And that really implies, because we conducted this a whole rule, poverty counties, if we extract it and, and extrapolate into a national level, we nearly have 30 million school age children are spent having anemia. So that's another kind of uh, uh, issue. So we also know anemia at the school age also impact their school performances. And the studies by many have already kind of confirmed that, and even from our own study. So in summary of these cases that in the longer run, the implication for the economy of a society is that hundreds of million children are negative and are cognitively impaired and they are not competitive in school system. And they're likely to drop out uh, more than others. And then when the low wage job disappears, only high wage jobs left and employers would not hire those people who are not really prepared for it. So the polarization of the labor market, half of them, you know, so it's going to be, an, it has a huge implication. The society has to spend more and more on police and crime and control and security, large part of the labor force, and productive. So that's the vicious circle and stagnation that we don't want to have when the economy grow fast and reaching the middle income level. So in, in explaining the causes of the new food security challenges, I wanted to let you know is that Real question, what's going on? Countries are growing and growing fast, the wages are rising, and there's a lot of poor people, but not extreme poverty. So why don't the family invest in their babies, children, mothers-to-be? So that's where I come up with some later on about knowledge aspect and asymmetric information, probably. It's not hard science, but they need institutions in place to address those issues. Ooh, yeah. So there are two reasons that I wanted to summarize here. One is the price of the food. So the victim of their own success in phase one is that investment in agriculture and open door policies are behind the growth, contributed to alleviate the worst the population, the, the poverty population, and they made the price of food low. So the cheap calories. You know, for staples, raise the demand for staples by those in the lower end of the income distribution, even though they could, so uh, though they could afford more. And many reasons for not spending more on diverse diet. That's one reason is that real cost of meat and fruits and vegetables are not only relatively expensive, but also they are absolutely expensive in real terms because. You need refrigerator, and you need markets close by, and also you need time for markets not close by that might be fast transferring, so the transportation, and more expensive to prepare. So when I was, we did a study on, you know, adding kind of uh, more diet for school children, uh, like meals, and the school principal said, look, Providing us money to buy meat is not sufficient. We look at the market, they only runs once a week. So I need storage, I need the refrigerator to put those food into storage. And then some local uh, schools also started the egg program. They said, oh, the government had a good intention providing eggs for all the kids. Provided, you know, given the, the, the back side of it, Eggs don't have iron, but at least it's the, still good nutri uh, protein. So what the local principles, I have to look for all the households for eggs that are needed for my kids in order to provide it one egg a day. Basically, there wasn't a market there. So those institutions really put high, much higher kind of prices on those uh, for providing meat, a protein of a diverse kind of food. 
And there's also many competing uses for extra income. We always say in China, because in China in recent decades, we have initiated a lot of welfare programs, basically by transferring the money to households. And on per capita basis, it probably we could have five, six, or seven hundred yuan per capita, uh, uh, no, per uh, 10,000 yuan per capita, uh, per household, something like. But why, why can't they buy meat for the children? But there are lots of competing kind of uses for that. Because of the, uh, you know, because of the imperfect market, a credit market, and then insurance system, they have to save for marriage, save for house, save for retire, saving for retirement. So, and for catastrophic illness, because the impact in health insurance market, and also, you know, all those really are really real and competing. So I will tell you later on why nutrients are, you know, children nutrients are not really in the in the radar screen of households because. Obviously, that's not, phys uh, not visible because if you are slim and short, you know you something, but you don't see. So I show you later, and there's, a, and then the absence of knowledge. This is where shown. So because it's a hidden hunger, because you don't see that, because you are micronutrient deficient, because there's no outside symptoms. That's why. So the slow and imperfect correlation between nutrition intervention and EMEA status, and also behavior and performance and uh, physical status. There's a lag of knowledge to show it. With high rates of migration, caregiver is being done by grandma. And when you ask them, do you need to give babies additional food, you know, solid food or somehow when they're six months? Well, I've never ate meat when I was a baby. When I, my son was a baby, I never fed them with the meat. But they grow fine, but they forget that, that we say the time inconsistency between demand for skill and need for investment skills. That current health and cognitive skills are fine for now, but not, for, not sufficient for 20 years from now. Because when the grandma feed their babies, they, they produce in farmers. They work in the field. If they are strong, it's good enough. They have 90 point, you know, IQ 90 is, was good enough, but now, IQ90, you could not compete in the competitive system. You need about 100 to 120. So that's what they don't realize because it's a consistent knowledge there. And lack of a former nutrition education training is part of it. So it's sometimes it's not money issue. It's really the knowledge issue. So our empirical evidence shows the most educated person in the rural communities in the poor you know, countryside in China are school principals. But one, only one out of 20 even know what it means by anemia. I said, well, anemia? Yeah, I heard. You are not having enough blood. So that's what they say. So, oh, you have pale face. Oh, you, you grow slim or somehow. So those are the knowledge they have about anemia. And then principals believe that only 3% of their kids were really, you know, anemic. But we found out that more than 35. And only two out of 100 caregivers have had any formal education training about nutrition. So it's funny, when we ask the, those, our in, in, uh, interviewers, village kind of uh, caregivers, do you know that when you raise pigs, you need add micronutrient? Or, or whether you need add micronutrient? Yes, of course. Do you know you feed babies, you also need? No, we don't need. So they know. They have knowledge of raising pigs more than the knowledge of raising the babies. So when we ask, 100% of them say, yes, they need to add micronutrients to their feed to the pigs. But very few say their babies need micronutrients after six months or somehow. So this is a lack of knowledge, which is really something we can fix. So the policy responses we're talking about this is that their social return is to good nutrition, individual nutrition to the, uh, and individuals leads to an individual return to good nutrition. But it's, it's hard for individuals that are poor to invest in something which they don't even see good, you know, seen these days. And that has a return is 10 to 20 years away or 20 years from now on because that really, they, they're not aware of this, and they don't think, they think about tomorrow, next year, but not in 20 years from now. And they probably think their children can step out and go to construction work, but they don't think about 20 years time, there's no construction site for them to work on. So that's the thing. And therefore, there appears to be a role of state 
in trying to address micronutrient deficiency based on food insecurity. So when we wrote the policy brief to the government, say, hey, babies are micronutrients. Hey, can't parents buy the food for them? Yes, they have the money, but they might not have the knowledge and where to seek kind of uh, knowledge training. When we ask the caregiver where they got the micronutrient supplement information, they say, from formula powdered milk cells and from my neighbors or peers. Um, so they, they never got the formal training and that's really, we, we're working with the government trying to get those information through the system because it's not really a research kind of project can done. You need to have a protocol ready and then I know one of my friend who is from working CDC, he gave birth to a baby in the US. He said, as soon as that baby was born, he, she got individualized the training. Said, when in the one week or two weeks or when they have to vaccine, when they have to feed something. In China, in theory, we should have those things there, but there's no system that working well in this case. So that's one of the policy implication. Of course, one of the inter possible interventions is education in schools, because the children need to start to know what are the problems. Training in villages through public health system. In China, we have very good system, where health system, we thought, kind of at least it can transfer the information from top to the bottom. We just need, them, need to give them packages, what to train, you know, how we get this knowledge to them in a simple way. A lot of those caregivers don't have education more than three or four years of time. So that's really a, a fundamental kind of challenge. Like urban area, when I, my colleague says, I got information from internet somewhere. I said, hey, how many rural farmers can surf the internet or have the access even? So those are the problem. Of course, we're also in talking about technology. We need agriculture diversification. This is really against the trend. With commercialization, specialization, that's really, it's difficult to reverse. So that's one of the challenge. Of course, fortification is one of the things that commercial kind of perfect market are thinking. But in China, lots of us are really uh, semi-subsistent, especially in the poor areas, the fully self-subsistent in terms of producing. So I have a, I don't know the time, how much time I have, but I have a story when we got, when we, okay, when we got to the micro, we found the school age children are anemic, and then the CDC people says, oh, we are developing fortified flour, wheat flour, so the northern people eat uh, noodles and uh, bread, we should give, uh, suggest them to buy. So we look at the market, and none of those, you know, none of those manufacturers are producing fortified flours. Why? Because there was no, no demand. All the farmers are producing their own wheat and meal in their own flours. They don't go to market. So the fortified uh, flour factory mainly bankrupted it after one year because it had good intention, but there was no demand. So when you look at, when you have this technical kind of suggestion solutions, you also have to look at the market and institutions and consumer behaviors, whether those are ideal. And some others say they need fortified soil source. I think I said this before in some other form. I said, they said, yeah, fortified soy sauce, but you need to drink two bottles of soy sauce in order to get enough iron a day for those anemic kids, you know. That's basic. Good, thank you. <laughs> I have 10 minutes, so, but. <laughs> so this is really something, a challenge. But of course, we say the role of state, really direct a micro, you know, multi-mineral uh, nutrient supplement program is needed. China is starting this program for infants and babies. But now we're testing how good those can be delivered to the individual households. Like those, you know, kind of micronutrient powder sprinkler you can put into any kind of food that baby's eating. So we are trying to initiate that. But the challenge is that lots of people are mobile, like a migrant, the mothers are moving away. If it's really a resident based, it's difficult to do. So you have to have individual ID in order to track where they are, which is not really that easy these days. And of course, you know, we know that uh, there are some, for China, we have, MC, the, the Chinese government have uh, free uh, maternal and child health benefit programs in the prenatal and after natal uh, checkups and those. But we know in those poor areas, 
very few are taking up those you know, free uh, public services because the access itself has a cost. So we are introducing some CCT conditional cash transfer which we go to receive the ser free services, we gave them a subsidy because that way it could, you know, kind of incentivize them to come to use more. So what I wanted to say here is even governments that take action, still you need reinforcing programs to come up with. So it's not saying that I have a free program, everybody can use, but you need to understand that utilization access itself has a cost, especially for remote people. So that one we don't, we should not end up with providing making the service available, but we have to enforce it, the utilization by different kind of, uh, you know, uh, interventions beyond these programs already here. So the challenges of those interventions of education, uh, you know, education training is hard to teach. Oh, doc, the trick said, because so that's, I've already said that the, the parents or grandparents, are, I've raised up the children the way I did and they were all fine, they're healthy somehow. So and encourage that, actually I've already said in the previous slide the challenges of those, so i skip that. So, and supplementation is expensive, of course, difficult to run a CC conditional cash transfer in some areas. We also tried those um, uh, CCTs in the remote mountainous and minority areas, you know, getting access itself, getting the information passed on itself is very difficult. So now we are working with Minister of Education, oh, Minister of Health in China. They used to have a population control and population planning and control division, and now the the birth rate is reduced. So they said, okay, we need to shift our function from controlling the people to improve the quality of the people. So they are at this kind of uh, era of working with us to trying to improve the quality of the population. That's we're talking about China case. Of course, challenge of meeting new food security. You know, policymakers have to be thinking ahead. So when we talk talk about you know. We're going to have challenges in the future. We're not going to have quality labor forces. If you don't think ahead, you said, no, everybody's employed. We even have labor shortage now. So why should we worry? So kids are, you know, at, when the wages was low and everybody get a job, when wage increasing at this beginning stage, everybody can still get a job. But when the wage is higher enough, nobody would hire a person who didn't even complete the middle school education because of uh, no competitiveness. So you're really thinking about education is for the people 20 years from now, not for the labor forces tomorrow. So this is really one of the challenge. And this is the same way with you know, addressing the micronutrient deficiency because you need to invest now in the babies and infant, and you see the results in 20 years time or 30 and 40, 50 years time from now, because they get a better job in the future, they have a higher income. If they're a vicious, the negative vicious circle, you know, they are basically non-competitive, don't have a job and have a poor health. So you, you, you have to think about in 20 years or 30 years time from now, the consequences of addressing or not addressing these issues. So individuals, especially poor households, they don't have that mind at this moment. So it has to be the society and the government to push that forward. Um, we, want, we also, I think, all of those really trying to justify why this is a challenge because we are maybe the issue in the rapid growing kind of uh, uh, and stage and also the type of growth that happens in a globalized and high-tech world. And if movement from middle income to high income lasts several generations, and that's going to be a challenge as well. So learning about nutrition can occur slowly, wage can rise more slowly. So all of those we see as challenges. When I use the, is this a new challenge? I think definitely this is a new challenge. The challenges we were not aware, the challenges we probably are not patient enough to wait to see the results. So all of those would pose the challenges to us. Not only the scientists, I think the, I said some, in the some venue, I said sometimes technologies are ready, but implementation of those technologies need more than just technology, substance itself, but need institution and need policy and the markets as well. So 
Irony of combating this food insecurity is difficult, so you need a policy prescription. Of course, those are easy to say, but difficult to achieve. To, so I wanted to stop here. I have a few slides after, but I just want to stop here. I don't want to run over time, so thank you very much.